So I'm honoured to welcome my next guest on Words of Wisdom, journalist, novelist, screenwriter and friend of the Beatles, Ray Connolly. Welcome, Ray. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. I'm not just delighted to chat with you, but delighted that you're here at, uh, at all after your, your brush with death and COVID in, in 2020. Are you OK now? Yeah. I'm absolutely fine. It was... Um... Incredi I'm incredibly lucky, you know, I mean, what they never tell you in hospital when you're, I mean, I never knew how close I was to not being, and they never tell you that, but 102 days in intensive care, and you've no idea the things, they're the people who look after you, the nurses, the doctors, they, they always come in smiling. When I became conscious again, they were always smiling, always nice, always happy, and they never ever give you any indication of what they've been through. And, you know, they would have seen people die in the next room. I just know it, you know, they did because many people died and they never ever let you know as the patient what they're suffering. And it must be very hard, it must be terrible. And they were heroes, absolute heroes. So I was really, I'm really grateful to have, um, I'm grateful to them for being alive, obviously, but I'm also grateful to them for making it, for giving me that view of life, that actually how heroic they were, I mean, you know, it's extraordinary. And they're absolutely amazing. And, and when you were, were recovering from COVID, I believe that the first signs of life came when you heard Del Shannon's Runaway being played to you, a, a track which you, you used in, in, in your film, uh, That'll Be The Day. It was, yeah, it was one of those. There was there were several signs of life. But the thing is you get are endless dreams, uh, nightmares, basically. So when um, they played me runaway and things like that, so, uh, and I sort of, I had the children came in because they couldn't come in for the first two months. And then eventually the, the kids were allowed in with my wife came in and they played things for me. And uh, the nurses asked, um, asked my family, for anything that would remind me of who I was, because I was unconscious for so long. And they all offered things up. And when I woke up, there was all this stuff on the wall, there were pictures of Ringo, and pictures of David Essex, and pictures, and I think, why are these things there? Why, how do they know so much about me? And then uh, David Putnam sent me uh, posters for that for the day, and for starters and things. And it was sort of like, how do they know about? And I only realized very slowly what I was told, I was told that um, the nurses had asked for through all this stuff to bring me back into consciousness and to know who I was and remember who I was. And yeah, and so play, and then, then they played me records. And I, but in, you know, you know this in your head, you have records in your mind all the time. I mean, I, I walk around the house at the moment, I've been singing. Um, uh, that's that one of my by Melanie's song, the one I, I mean, Melanie died the other day, and I remember meeting my new key, her. yeah. And uh, I, I've been seeing that for the last two days in my head, walking around the house. And when I was in hospital, I went through sort of that all my back list of songs going back, you know, never mind, going back 50 years, you know. Um, and it was, it was extraordinary, so you, you know, these things go. The mind is like a big computer, and actually, when you need it, it's there. It's there for you. I'm really, I'm really glad you're here. That's a, that's the main point. And you've recently published your superb memoir, Born yeah. at the Right Time. But you were also born in the right place too, when the Mersey Sound was was conquering the world. Well, actually, yeah, that was slightly less because um, I, I lived um at first about 12 miles from Liverpool and then about 15 20 miles from Liverpool so I wasn't really involved in Liverpool I mean to me Liverpool was a place you went to to get the train to London to be honest it really was until um, after university I came to university here at, in in London and then went back to Liverpool to get a job my first job was on the Liverpool Daily Post and the first person I interviewed the first two or three people one was Roger McGuff the poet and the other was his friend Mike McCartney who is still a friend, and they're both still friends, and that that started me off. So I was very lucky in that respect too. So, but Liverpool itself, I mean, I worked there for three years, but it didn't have such a big effect on me. Uh, in fact, I remember 
remember the Beatles. I was in America when 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 She Loves You came out, and I remember it was some really snooty sort of Harvard academics. Oh, that doesn't sound very good. And I thought it was wonderful. <laughs> I thought it was great. I couldn't wait to get back to the. I'm missing all the fun. It's all going on behind me. I want to get home again. So that happened, yeah. Well, when you were in London, you succeeded Maureen Cleave at the Standard. She, she yeah. created a lot of publicity with that story. I think yeah. probably unintentional. Yes, and, and she had, as a journalist, she had a very close relationship. Uh, with John, with, with John particularly. With John in particular. And you, yeah. you went on to have a relationship with, with the Beatles as well, which was, was yeah. quite close, surprisingly, for a journalist. So, so did that form any part of your own sort of view of how, how to do the job when you, you, you first landed the assignment at the Standard? Not really. I, I was just... When I went for my interview, I mean, I didn't know that Maureen had actually got off to get married to some guy in Peru or to go to Peru or someone like that. And um, they asked me what my interest was. Uh, I'd have taken any job at all. You know, I'd spent three years in Liverpool and I'd have taken any job they offered me. If they said ed education or foreign, foreign, you know, foreign report or whatever. And so what are your interests? And I said, well, I like rock and roll, actually. That's what I'm really interested in. And they said, well, hang on a sec. Maybe you could fit in here then, because Maureen had gone. So I, there was a vacancy, and I and I stepped into it. And Maureen was became a friend, I mean, many years. Sadly, Maureen died a few years ago. but uh, And before she died, she got outside. And I said, well, that was a shame, because I tried to get her on a documentary. And then I realised that she couldn't have done it because uh, she couldn't remember. Um, but uh, my relationship with the Beatles was, at first, I was sort of slightly in awe of Maureen because she'd done so so well. But, but I got over that. And uh, I'm trying to... I met Paul. I met Paul through his... Not through his brother Michael, but through Mr McCartney. Mr McCartney. I mean, it's bizarre. I went on the Mag Magical Mystery Tour and then um, I didn't know anybody. I, I see this young boy in Fleet Street and they all seemed much more grown up than me. I, I didn't know anybody. And then suddenly uh, we're in a hotel in South Devon the first night and I sat there on one side of the room and looked across and they were all over there. The Beatles were being very friendly with these people, with the other journalists. I didn't know anybody. I thought, how am I going to get from here to there? And suddenly somebody sits down next to me and I looked there, and it was Paul. I thought, well, I've got to say something. I've got Paul McCartney sitting next to me. So I said, I, I know your dad. And it really, how do you know my dad? So we got a bit talking about his father, Mr. McCartney. And uh, from then on, I was in with Paul, you know, and he sort of led me on. And then a bit later on, when when the film came out, Magic Mr. Draw came out and was on the telly and got slammed by everybody, I was asked to get a to, to do a piece on it and I thought oh god so I thought I, I'll ring Paul up and I had his phone number from, from somebody else not from his brother from somebody else I rang Paul and it was just after Christmas 1967 yeah and Paul was still in bed and his father answered and I said it's Ray Connolly Mr McCartney <laughs> is your Paul is your Paul up he said oh hello son no he's still in bed uh, Oh, well, why, why, why don't you call again? So I called again about three times. And in the end, M Mr. Mack said, you know, son, God loves a trier. I'm going to go and get Paul to come and speak to you. <laughs> so, so Paul's dad got Paul out of bed and said, you've got to talk to this lad. It's, 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 it's Liverpool, you know. And uh, so that, that was it. So I was in with Paul and then that led to, I never got on with, with George, I think he was jealous, not jealous. Well, he, he was jealous of of Paul and John, obviously. That wasn't my fault. But I think he thought I was too close to John and Paul. And he was right, I was. Um, it's my regret because I could have, I should have spent more time with him or, or pursued him more. And I didn't pursue enough, you know. I wanted to, but it was much easier for me to talk to, to, talk to John or to Paul. And George was sort of a bit standoffish. And I'm sure he thought, this guy's in with John and Paul. And these things happen. 
I've actually got uh, the interview you did with Paul just after Magical Mystery Talks. Uh, there's a, a section I quite like here. There's, there's one thing I used to regret and feel guilty about. Mm. When Ringo joined us, I used to act all big time with him. I was a know-all. I'd been yeah. in the sixth form and thought I'd read a bit, you know. It began putting him off me and me off me. Yeah. So um, quite, quite well, a revelation to, to get out of Paul at that time. It was very nice, wasn't it? I mean, Paul was good to good to interview. You know, he was um, he was. Uh, I mean, he was much more of a, a diplomat than the others. He knew what he was. He knew what he was saying. But um, that that surprised me when he said that. Actually, he said something else on that day too. I think he played me Lady Madonna, and I said Bad Penny Blues. <laughs> <laughs> he said, "You're not supposed to say that." In <laughs> But it was. I mean, anybody would. And uh, but you know, it, it was um, Jane Asher was. That's why I was living with too, wasn't she? Um, so it was. Yeah, Paul was. I always. I probably was closer to John later on. Um, but Paul was was the first, and he took me up, and he he sort of passed me on, and then when. You know, and so. I, I saw a lot of him. I mean, I went when he got married. Well, when Mike McCartney got married, I went and Paul was there, obviously. And then um, I saw quite a lot of Paul. And Paul was around Apple. He was very busy, always busy doing things. He still is, isn't he? That's basically, he still is. And uh, I was around, you know, a lot. Yeah. So. Yeah. You became part of the Beatles circle you know, remarkably quickly, and uh, so much so that you were invited into the, the White Album sessions at, at Abbey Road. What, what do you recall of George Martin and his role oh, George, in the White yeah. Album um, sessions? Well, yeah. at the time, I was scared stiff of George because he, he, he was the boss, that, and the Beatles were all my age, so that was easy. They were, you know, I didn't, I only went to a few sessions, um, but I remember going to one night, going to Abbey Road. To interview Yoko, and she hadn't been interviewed before, not a big page anyway. And um, when it was finished, um, Paul turned up and Paul took me into the band room, which was just off the studio, and sat down at the piano, began to play me like Lord in Claude and Money Honey, those sort of things, you know, on the piano, <clears throat> and to sing. And then he, he suddenly went into Let It Be. and. Uh, but he wasn't called Let It Be then. He told this song about, about Mother Mary Comes to Me. And he hadn't sort of hadn't finished the whole song. So it was really interesting. And um, <clears throat> then it, I thought this would be on the new album. And it wasn't when it came out. It wasn't on it. And it, it was like 18 months down the road, wasn't it, when it was finally released. And then he finished it by then. But um, George... I was really scared of George. I got to know George very well later on, but at, at first, because he, he was like a teacher, you know. I mean, he really felt like a, a, a real teacher. And he, um, you know, sure was so much rain, and he just said, that's all right, you can sit there, you know. And, and, and I thought, sit there, type on me. There was one time I remember, uh, I think it, it was an Abbey Road session, and it may have been that thing when um, George has to come in. I mean, and in the end, I love you, that, that one. And then I think it follows, I think that's followed by a guitar break. And I think George was, I mean, I'm not sure, but may not. But anyway, George was putting it on this guitar break and it wasn't quite right. And I'm standing watching them uh, with, and George is down there in the studio and George and George Martin and Paul and me are at the top there. And Paul kept saying, could you do it again, George? It's not quite right. Can you just do it again? And then, and it sort of went on. Like, and I thought, God, I wouldn't want to be George Harrison, having been told all, all, all the time, over and over again, by Paul McCartney, that it's not quite perfect yet. And Paul is a perfectionist. and He wants everything to be perfect. That's, that's what Paul is. Um, and... Uh, so I remember feeling a bit sorry for George in that situation. I thought, well, he's had a lifetime of this because, you know, nothing is ever probably good. I mean, that's the way Paul is. I mean, he's a very, very clever 
and a very talented person, but I'm sure nothing's ever quite good enough. It can be just that little bit better, which, you know, if if that's what you're doing, can be could drive you crackers, yeah? And there was less communication between Paul and John when, when Yoko came on the scene. I believe you were actually the first person to tell Paul about uh, John's self-portrait film. How did he respond? Yeah. <laughs> we, were, we were on the stairs. At, at, I was good. He was coming down with Linda and I was going up. Uh, I mean, in those days, you could walk into Apple, you know. I mean, I, I did. And go, I mean, Derek Taylor was on the third floor, I think. And, and you go up and Derek was always very welcoming. And I'd wander in. It was a kind of place to go to when I had nowhere else to go. I'd go, I'd go there. And there's always somewhere, someone there to talk to. Anyway, and Paul's coming down with Linda. And I, and I said, oh, what about John's new film? And he said, what? I said, it's his penis in an erection. <laughs> and they're not. And he said... What? Tell me again. <laughs> so I told him again. <laughs> he said, uh, he said, I don't want to see, I don't want to see John Lennon's penis having an erection, you know, if, if you don't mind. Uh, and then he went, well, I think he was really thinking, oh, God, here we go again. Another, another outrageous story that John was doing. And John, John could be very difficult, you know. This is what, what people never realise is how hard it must have been for um, I think you better rephrase your words there right <laughs> yeah okay people never realize how difficult it could have been for, uh, <laughs> for um, the other Beatles when I mean George didn't care but I think Paul was sort of thinking oh does he have to keep doing this I mean you know the, the cover of the two virgins album it was funny for a moment but then you know it's kind of, you think, oh, why, why would you want to do this? And I'm sure that later in life, John thought, had a short life, but later in life, John would have probably thought, I'm not sure that's a great idea, <laughs> actually, you know. Of because course, you wanted... became close to John as well. It was a turning point in your relationship with John and, and Yoko when the, St uh, the Standard published your article with the headline, The Day the Beatles Died. Well, that was accidental. Um, I knew that they'd, that they'd been falling out, and I'd written this piece, and they, I'd never said the Beatles have died. I knew they'd been falling out, and I never said it. And I'd, I'd spent quite a lot of time talking to John about the songs, you know, and um, I had to ring him up. No, what happened? I rang him first, no, then what happened, yeah. And I read that piece and I never said it because I didn't know, I didn't know that, that John had left. And then uh, what happened was I got to the newspaper the next day, the Evening Standard, and, and the paper had the, the day the Beatles died, Ray Connolly, I thought, oh my God, I'm gonna be in real trouble today because I'm gonna get the lawyers on from Apple and God knows who else. And instead, I got a rose wrapped in cellophane of John and Yoko with love from John and Yoko. I thought, ah, bingo. I, by accident, the sub-editor who wrote the headline, and it, the piece didn't say that, but the sub-editor had intuited that that's what I was trying to say. Uh, I wasn't, actually. So on that phone call, the sub or maybe another phone call, John said, we're going to Canada next week. Why don't you come with us, me and Yoko? And we're going to stay in Ronnie Hawkins' house. And if you want to come, you can come. And uh, and I'll tell them at Apple to, you know, to book you a flight. So I said, yeah, I'll come, I'll come. So uh, I went to the airport and I was given all kinds of stuff, um, c computer stuff. I mean, not like this, but really primitive computer stuff and and what it was it was john john wanted to make films of himself in in canada and so i was lumbered with taking it in which was fine until i got to trying to get past the customs with it and, and all this stuff he said what's all what's all that I said oh this is for a friend what's the name of the friend well it's just a friend from england you wouldn't know him and uh so they said well you've got to tell it. i thought okay it's John Lennon. And of course he said, John Lennon! 
So <laughs> and people all turn around and oh, yeah. and uh, I said, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I think he wants to make a film while he's here. He does a little private film, and they said, uh, well, you can come in, but you got to leave the stuff here. I said okay, whatever. So when I got to, I, I got a cab and I had the address, and it's about fifteen miles out of Toronto where Ronnie Hawkins lived, who was a new rock and roller, and. Uh, I get to the, the house and John turns up and he says, oh, Ray, good, great you're here. Come upstairs, I want to tell you something. So I thought, oh, what, what, what is it? And John and Yoko shared, were sharing, or not sharing, John and Yoko had Ronnie Hawkins' bedroom. So Ronnie and Wanda Hawkins had to sleep somewhere else. It didn't matter, you know, because they, they were the stars, so they got the... And I was sleeping in attic or something. And um, so he called me in and, and he said, uh, I said, what, what is it? He said, well, I've left the Beatles. I think, oh my God, this is a huge story. But at the same time, I'm scared because I'm thinking, no, oh, don't, don't, don't break up the Beatles. I mean, I love the Beatles. I mean, I really, really like them. Don't do that, whatever you do. And uh, so I said, oh, well, and then, he, then he said, but, don't put it out yet. Don't write it now. But when you want, when I want it out, I'll, I'll just give you the nod and you can put it out. And I said, okay. And um, so all weekend, I spent about three or four days there. And I came back and I would phone him several times during the next few weeks. Uh, what about putting out the story about, no, just wait a bit, wait a bit. And in, and uh, because he was waiting to finish the album, Let It Be, which was being edited. And Paul was getting bored. And Paul was still unsure whether it really was the end of the Beatles, because, you know, no one really knew. Uh, and John was, was doing some really crazy things, like hanging out with Michael X, who was not a good person to, to hang out with. In all honesty, he wasn't. And, uh, and then... It, then it comes out, you know, and uh, Paul Paul puts it out. Paul didn't actually ever say I've left the Beatles, but that's how it was recorded, how it was assumed to be by the Daily Mirror. When the headline was Paul McCartney quits Beatles, and Paul had never said it. And, but you know, there's another thing about the sub editor was ahead of the story and put it out. And so there, there you go. And uh, yeah, so. Did John actually say to you, listen, do you want to know a secret? Do you promise not to tell? <laughs> no. He said, but he did, in effect, because I promised not to tell, yeah, obviously. Um, and I thought... Deep, that deep, was, deep down, do I, you think he was, he, he thought that because you were you were press, that you, you couldn't resist, and did he really want to get the story out? Well, I've, that's what that, that's what I've thought all these years. Did he really want it out, or or was he? I don't know. Or well, whether he just couldn't. He, he wanted to tell somebody, and then he may have wanted it out uh, and didn't want to be responsible for it. And then he could say, "Well, well, I just told Ray Condon." You know, I mean, it, t telling the journal, but also to me, uh, and maybe not to other journalists. I thought, well. He's a friend. He's flown me here. I mean, by then, by then we were quite, quite, quite good friends. And he'd flown me there, first class, very expensive, all these things. And I was living with him, and I spent um, a lot of time with him after that. And I just sort of thought, well, you can't betray a friend if you promise not to tell, and I did. Then you can't. But other people said you were stupid. That that was a great story. Why didn't you sit? And I said, well, I promised. I said I wouldn't. You know, that was simple as that. You know. Well, well the few people in the press were integrity, so it's, it's good to hear. So, well, <laughs> how, how did you respond when John asked you if you'd written his obituary in 1970 at Tintenhurst? Yeah, he said, and I said, no. He said, well, when you do, can you can you, can you read it to me? Because I'd love to read it. I said, well, I mean, we were, we were both like 29 or something. I thought, this is so many years away. It's, it's never going to happen. Or, you know, it's like 50 years away. I didn't know it wasn't. But um, so, yeah. But, yeah, 
I didn't. Uh, I did have to write it the day he died, which was a very a very quick one for the Evening Standard because they rang me up. I, I was going to go and see John on the day he died, and um, your code rang. I I called him a couple of times at the at the, the Dakota, and I knew he did a new album, and um, I said, well. Uh, Yoko was a bit offhand, saying, oh, well, not, not now, Ray, you know, soon, but not now. So I said, okay. I thought, well, I'm not, I'm not going to beg, you know. <laughs> I've got my other work to do as well. So I, I put it to one side. And uh, and then suddenly Yoko rang me and said, where are you? The BBC were here this weekend. You're meant to be here. I thought we thought you were coming. John was expecting you. And I said, well, sorry, but uh, I'll come tomorrow if you want. Yeah, come tomorrow, come tomorrow. So I called the Sunday Times then and said, I'm going to go and see John Lennon tomorrow. Great. And I was going to write the whole back page, the article's back page about John Lennon. And uh, in those days, it, it was a huge, being the editor or writing articles was a really big job on Sunday Times. And uh, so I went home and I played the record, listened very carefully to it now, packed my bag, everything, put in a call to the the Dakota the night, you know, and said, um, and I got someone who worked there, and, she, and he said, oh yeah, John's expecting you, well, he's looking forward to seeing you, he says, he says, he says, come straight here when you get in, into Kennedy Airport, come straight here, and looking forward to seeing you, and I'll see you tomorrow, okay, good night, and then at 4.30, the phone rang, woke me up, I thought it was the taxi come to take me to the airport, because, you know, and I thought, it's come way too early. And it wasn't, it was a guy actually on the Daily Mail. He'd been woken up from his, from the Daily Mail's office in New York that John Lennon had been shot. And I said, no, 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 I'm going to go and see him. I'm, 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 I'm going quite, quite soon, really. No, Ray, he's been shot. I thought, is he hurt? Is he injured? I don't know. Oh, well. So I sat up and plumbed and my wife was sitting up there. Well, what can we do? So I went downstairs and turned on the BBC World Service, which was the only way of, of overnight news then. And at five o'clock, they confirmed John Lennon was shot. He was shot dead. And um, so I went back upstairs and told Plum. Uh, had a cup of tea. And, anyway, I didn't go to New York that day. John was gone. And Yoko got very cross because she rang me up a few days later. So why didn't you come? You didn't, you didn't want to see the widow. No, just John. And I said, well, no, it wasn't that. But I'd never got in. There were so many people outside of the Dakota. I, you know, I just wouldn't have got in. Yes, you would. Ringo got in. I said, but I'm not Ringo. I wouldn't, yeah. you know. I had a lot of police and people. He said, well, I'm not okay. So I didn't, didn't go. And so, But I, instead, I wrote a, a, a very quick thousand word obituary of John. Um, which probably wasn't that good because it was written. I was really very, very up, upset. I mean, I'm terribly upset. And trying to do it was just such a awful shock. And have, but that was my job. I was a journalist. I mean, you don't say, you just don't say, um, I can't do it. You do it. You do it. Even though inside you're sort of thinking, oh, you know. Did you, your your mind must have gone racing back to that day in, in 1970 when John had asked if you had written his yeah, obituary. Oh, yeah. What do you think was going through his head at that moment? Do you think he was thinking about his legacy and how he he he, he would be yeah. viewed when when he went, when he was gone? He always thought about his legacy all the time. He was he was always um, always banging on what 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 people. He loved the newspapers. I mean, just he's always reading the newspapers about himself. He'd read it. He'd laugh, I mean, but when the unkind thing said, John would be really, really amused and he'd laugh at them and say, have you seen that thing that John Lovett said in the Daily Mirror? It says, I'm the clown of the year. And he laughed and he loved all that. In fact, I took that over to him in New York. No, in Canada, because there's a big piece, big, big spread, clown of the year, John Lennon. And John said, bring it over. I want to see that. So I took it over and he'd laugh. He loved it. So, it was very aware of his legacy all well and all the time I knew him. Um, yeah, that's 
that 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 was John. I mean, you were also one of the, the first people in the world, I believe, to hear "Imagine" because he, he summoned you to his bedroom to play you an acetator of "Imagine." Well, what, what was your first reaction when you heard that? Well, I'll tell you. But you always when when John wanted to talk to you privately, you were always in his bedroom wherever it was. And that was probably a leftover from when he was with the Beatles and they could only talk privately in the, in, in the bedroom. But when I went down to Tittenhouse Park, it was always in the bedroom. You know, I'd go in, I'd have a cup of tea with the girls downstairs and whatever. And then John would say, God, I want to tell you something. <laughs> because he didn't want it to be, you know. So that was the way that, that worked. And uh, he played me the flip side, the... the Whatever the, the flip side, I can never remember. Was it? It's so hard. Or, what was the flip side of Imagine? C can you remember? Not the one in England, the one in America. Did you remember? Uh, that? Well, the one the one I got was Working Class Hero, which I think no, it wasn't was that, released though. later in the UK in seventy five. I think wasn't it? So yeah. um, nineteen uh, seventy. Uh, give me, give me, give me some truth. I think was, was give me some was, truth. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. I think it was give me some truth. Um, he played that first. So what do you think? And I said, well, I mean, what, what it was, it was quite funny because I went into the bedroom, Yoko is on the bed, and Johnny's saying, I've got to get this thing out for you, hang on. And he got out a little down set or something like that. It wasn't a big, I mean, he, he had all this equipment, but he couldn't make it work. So he said, I played on this. So he got the down set and put it on, and he played me, give me some truth. Yeah. And he said, and I said, oh, yeah, all right. What do you think? I said, yeah, I said, yeah. That's yeah, right. Thinking, thinking. It's just another, just another, another dirge, you know. So I'm just, I thought, well, what's on the flip side? So he so turned it over and played me Imagine. He, he just had a sort of, yeah. Uh, he had a. It was an album, but the first side of the second side was Give Me Some Truth. The first side, the first side was Imagine, yeah, and it was a. No label thing. Anyway, so he played me Imagine. And I said, I said, surely this should be the A side. James said, yeah, this should, this should be the A side. Then he just turned to Yoko the bed and said, Yoko Ray thinks uh, Imagine should be the A side. She said, I like that one too. And uh, and I thought, they're having me on, you know, because <laughs> they knew what the A side was going to be. They knew, he knew what he'd written. But Maybe did, either he wanted just to see what I'd if I'd be, be you know, what I'd say, and uh, or he liked the confirmation of someone of his own age saying, you know. Anyway, yeah. So we did that. Then a bit later on, it was going on the Parkinson show, which I helped arrange. Uh, and uh, well, what it was, I knew Mike Parkinson. And he'd asked me if I'd help find the people for the show. And it was the, the first series. And uh, I said, well, I didn't know anybody. I'm not, not really. I said, well, I think probably maybe get John Lennon. And he said, yeah, probably get John Lennon. So but they weren't sure because they thought that John was um, crackers. And they thought that he might take his clothes off or Yoko would take his clothes off or whatever. I said, they won't do that. I think very sensible. Type of fellow, you know, not, not going to do that. So, anyway, we got. So, I went down with, with a researcher to set it up and everything and, and explain. And she explained what what time they would be there and everything. And uh, I think we played her Imagine too. And then John said, Here, you have it. And he gave me the, his copy. I said, What about you? He said, oh, I've got another one, <laughs> of course. And I said, oh, okay, great. So he gave me his copy of, of Imagine and um, and he went on the show and at the end of it, Mike Parkinson said, well, we should have had you on for longer. We'll, it'll be longer next time. It never was a next time because about a month, two weeks later, John went to live in New York and never came back. But uh, that's how it was. Of course, they made Parkinson uh, conduct his interview in a bag if he asked any questions about the Beatles. It was... It was an endless joke about baggage and all these things. And yeah, I was thought it was, I thought it was daft anyway. But I mean, John did do some very daft things. I mean, the whole Michael X thing, I, I was 
really sort of very unsure and which turned out very, very badly in the end for everybody. Um, Michael X particularly, in that he was finally executed in Trinidad, I think. Um, but um, John had some, you know, he was, John was desperate to be, to be on the side of the underdog, any underdog virtually. And it would, so people would flock to him to try and, um, what's the word? to try and get his support. And some of the people, you know, well, he shouldn't have supported them. I mean, I don't, I mean, Michael X was certainly someone who I never liked. And, uh, you know, that's the way it goes, isn't it? I mean, when you're, when you're a superhero, it must be very difficult to actually, actually tell who are the, who are the good guys and who are the bad guys. And some of the bad guys did hang on, did hang on to John for a bit. In the end, he did say, "I made a fool of myself with with, with some of those things early on, those revolutionary ideas and stuff." And he said that I think before he died, not to meet us to other people. But you know, it, it's very difficult. It, you know, if you're surrounded by people telling you you're the most wonderful person in the world and all these wonderful things, it must have been murder. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you so much for spending so much time with us on, on Words of Wisdom today. I've, I've really enjoyed it. Thanks again. Good. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.